I'll do the tip same away. Up. I'll tip away. Hi, everybody. This is Dana Levin, and um, next to me, sort of, not really, is Mark Wunderlich and Mary Rufel, and we are really glad that you are here to hear them read um, their work this evening. This is an observable reading through St. Louis Poetry Center. St. Louis Poetry Center is the oldest a uh, poetry only nonprofit west of the Mississippi. This is our 75th anniversary and we wanted to celebrate by doing something special. And when Mark told me about the erasures exhibition that Mark and Aaron McKinney put up um, at the Robert Frost Stonehouse Museum, did I get that right as a name? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I thought, let's bring it here. So, um, so we did, and as part of um, the many events that have gone with this, we are presenting uh, Mark and Mary tonight to read from their work. Um, there is a comments box, and please uh, put your comments and your questions as they arise throughout the reading. There will be time for Q&A afterwards. If you are one of my students, write and say howdy, because <laughs> then I'll know you're here. Um, I want to tell you some other things. Um, this is the end of the observable reading series uh, for 21-22. Um, and then on April 23rd, Saturday, there is going to be a book launch celebration for my new book, Now Do You Know Where You Are, and Paul Tran's new book, All the Flowers Kneeling, at the High Low in person, Saturday, 7 p.m., and I hope that anybody who is in St. Louis or in driving distance comes because we want to have fun. Hi, Weston. Um, and I want to thank our co-sponsors, which are Bennington College and the Cransburg Arts Foundation. And I want to thank our funders, the Missouri Arts Council and um, Poetry Foundation. And I want to tell you also that if you do live within um, a distance of being able to come to St. Louis Poetry Center events, or even if you don't in this virtual age, become a member. Um, we give workshops, we do work in the schools, we do these readings, we are apparently now in the business of doing exhibitions. Um, check out membership and become a member and join us in our rousing activities. <laughs> Um, hi, Tina Kane. Um, Tina, yeah. Tina Kane is on there. What? Oh, I, I know Tina Kane. Yeah, Tina Kane is watching. Mary is happy. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> All right, so I am going to get going here. Um, and first, I'm going to introduce Mark Wunderlich. Mark is going to read. Um, and then um, I'll pop back in to introduce Mary and Mary will read and then we will see if you have any questions. Mark Wunderlich, this handsome gentleman is the author of four books of poetry, including The Anchorage, which received the Lambda Literary Award, The Earth Avails, which was a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Award and received the 2015 Rilke Prize. And the most recent book is God of Nothingness, which came out in 2021. Hi, Lizzie. He has received fellowship from the NEA, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Wallace Stegner Fellowship Program at Stanford, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Amy Lowell Trust, which meant that Mark had to stay out of the country and travel around Europe, and the Civitello Ranieri Foundation. Did I say that right? Ranieri? Sort of. Um, Wunderlich has taught at many institutions, including the graduate programs at Columbia University, San Francisco, San Francisco State University, and Sarah Lawrence. Mark is also an incredible arts administrator and let me tell you, it takes skill and diplomacy and true art to do it well. And Mark is a man's master. And Mark has worked for the Academy of American Poets, the Poetry Society of America, the University of Arizona Poetry Center, Poets and Writers Magazine, and the Napa Valley Writers Conference. Currently, Mark lives in the Hudson River Valley. He has taught at Bennington College since 2004, and he became the director of the Bennington Writing Seminars in August of 2017. Please welcome Mark Wunderlich. Thank you so much, Dana. And uh, thank you to everyone there in St. Louis who made this possible to Aaron Quick, to the St. Louis Poetry Center and to um, observable readings for inviting us. It is such an honor for me to be here in, uh, in this place 
with Mary and reading with her. And I'm so glad that this uh, occasion has brought us together here. And um, she's she's sitting across the room from me, so she is my audience um, as I as I read to all of you tonight. So um, I'm gonna read I'm gonna read around a little bit. I'm gonna read some poems from my most recent book, from God of Nothingness, and then I've got a couple new things uh, that I will read as well. And I may, if there if there's time, I may dip into a, a previous book. But the first poem that I'm going to read is called A Driftless Sun. Um, the Driftless Zone, it, it's gonna come up in maybe a couple poems. It's an area of, uh, of the upper Midwest. It takes up a little corner of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. And in the final ice age that came down, there's uh, the, the glaciers split and they made a little teardrop around this one region of the country, which means that there are uh, bluffs, um, there are deep valleys. The topography does not look like anything else in the Midwest, which was mostly flattened by the glaciers. Um, and it's a kind of mysterious place and it's referred to as the driftless zone. A driftless sun. It came to me to sell the family farm shift its failures to a man who planned to occupy the place for recreation, to hunt the deer that spook and shadow in the pines. My job to consign to another, my granddad's stunted grove of walnuts planted against the forester's advice with his hired man, Tiny, who died by stepping in front of a train. Though first he roped his dog, Bear, to a nearby tree, tacking on a note that read, take care off me. Does anyone remember this fat fact? A loaf of toast and a dozen eggs was Tiny's daily breakfast meal. Give it to me. I'll remember that bit too. I fished that muddy pond just once, its manure slurry slipped downstream from the Tullius brothers' hogs, shot the one buck trophied on my wall whose crippled hoof had slowed him dangerously down. In town, again, I pulled the locks off all the doors of the barn. Empty now, October now, the deer not yet come to any harm. Shanty. No one remembers what became of the people in the house now sway-backed in the marsh. Not the mice whispering and tunneled in the couch. Not the snapping turtle armored on a log, retracting his hard beak into wrinkled folds like foreskin. Not my mother who visited the shanty once as a nurse, noting the packed dirt floor, the walls pasted up in newsprint. They burnt waste oil in a barrel stove they got free from a garage, dipped their water from a spring now greened with cress. Artist Kyle Holtz knew something of the wife, but couldn't think, what was she called to home? When I was small, I heard roosters crowing from their yard and think I rode a school bus with the girl, but now I couldn't say for sure. Bill Went taught me to trap muskrats in that swamp, staking a conibear in the muddy muskrat runs with brush. I pulled their plush furred bodies from the ice, sold them for cash money to the fur man in the spring. How long will I keep telling stories just like this? Dirt floors and trap lines and a shack abandoned in a swamp. The vividness of that world is fading like my father's addled mind. Poverty is not poetry, this I know, but these pictures are what's left of childhood and now all my male relatives are gone, though lost and half remembering my father living on. I'm gonna take a slight detour here and I'm going to read a poem uh, by Mary. And um, this is from her book, My Private Property, which I'll have here, which is um, 
not her most recent. It's a fantastic book. And this is a prose poem and it's called Keys by Mary Rufel. Poor little keys. Success is not always to be expected for passive resistance having become the creed of keys. It takes the form of what their tormentors call obstinacy. And when it has become hereditary, I am afraid all the world won't get it out of them. All that can be done is to rescue a solitary individual now and then and try what care and kindness may make of them. Not long ago, shocked at the cruelty with which they were treated, a benevolent gentleman who had his theories about keys determined that he would bring up a young key as one raises a young child. A little one was brought and kept in a hole, but when the time came, the key would not come out of his hole and nothing would ever make him. The key's feelings were those of a snail being pulled from his shell. What became of that key was never known, but it seems certain one hole led to another, and it is my deepest hope that the benevolent gentleman let him live by trying him in every other holes, and that eventually they were passed between them, there passed between them an authentic feeling, even if it was one of defeat. That's keys by Mary Ruffel from My Private Property. Um, the next poem I'll read is a little longer and it's called First Chill. This year I did not love the first snow took no joy from the clean whiteness masking the contours of my yard, the last leaves stripped from the weeping beach to reveal its looping undercarriage, the ground hardened underfoot as the world froze in late November. I have secretly admired the first hard frost, killing the garden, putting an end to its many failures, the beetles and rusts finally put to death, and which are hard not to see as moral judgments on my insufficient diligence. This year, I put on the woolens, banked the stove with oak and elm, watched the snow feather down on the spruce, the grass still green under white, and I felt an uncommon dread for the inward turn that usually marks these days that end in early nights at home with their firelit contemplations, the bright privacy of the lamp encircling the page of an opened book. I wanted more, not of summer, with its swampy air and the nighttime amphibian whir, but of autumn, with its metallic skies swept with clouds, of the promise of something about to end, but not yet taken away. Above the Catskills, the peaks are veiled in a cloud of snow. This is where I think my dead have gone, my father and Lucy and John, the dead being impervious to cold, having left their bodies with us to cherish, but also to bury and to burn. I imagine them as they wander the high peaks, rippling like figures underwater like figures one dreams and forgets, a shape drawn and erased, so only the pencil's impress remains. Now that they are frozen, I know they are truly dead. Let me let them go, I pray to the god of nothingness, who rules those icy bluestone peaks, who hides the world of the living underneath his coat of snow. He has taken them from me, and now I will them coldly to go. I'm gonna do something very risky, which is to read a new poem, and I'll even show you what it looks like. It looks like that. I mean, it's that kind of a mess. 
So um, I'm I'm going to go ahead. This is um for some I've I've written a lot about animals. I've had a lot of animals in my life over the years, and currently there, I have none. There's no no I have no pet, and someone was asking me about that, and so I've written this poem about not having not having pen, any pets. And it's called No Horse. No horse. No baby goat gambling on an old cable spool. No piebald donkey. No cat fat and shedding by the stove. No rooster plumed and cartoonish dashing about the yard, putting a hole in my shin with his spur. No rescued cur. No teacup Pomeranian afraid to walk on dirt, piddling on a pee pad like a god. No god either. For that matter, no father. He's all ash. Now mother makes a hash of her checkbook. When she last drove, a small crash. No sheep weep on hilly born. No son not even a little one, no girl curled on gay papa's lap, no way to stop what I've started here but to steer, just steer the goddamn big car, look out, I shout out the window, but no one hears, who hears anyway, who's here anyway? I'm going to read a, a poem from uh, from two books ago, from The Earth of Ales. And it's a little longer. It'll probably be the one that I, I close with. And um, it's called Driftless Elegy. There's that word again. It begins with an anecdote about the uh, collapse of the Mississippi uh, the bridge that, that spanned the Mississippi in Minneapolis um, from some years ago. What happened after that collapse is bridges all along the, the Mississippi were inspected and many of them were closed for long periods of time while they made repairs based on that accident, including the one that connects Wisconsin and Minnesota and the town where I grew up. That meant that many people had to drive for over an hour in one direction to get to the next bridge to cross over and get to the other side where the grocery store was, where their job was, where the hospital was. And so it was a very strange period where people were driving hours and hours to cross the river, which was just a couple miles away. Driftless Elegy. The bridge over the Mississippi is shut, the traffic diverted to Wabasha, while authorities investigate the undergirding, which is corroded and in danger of collapse. Work has slowed on both sides of the river while an enterprising man with a pontoon boat ferries people from side to side. Fountain City has long been without a grocery store. Ops's market closed when I was a child. The owner whistled, and the women who worked the front counter tracked everyone's movements through the town, gazing out the plate glass windows with awnings shielding them from the sun. In Minneapolis, the Coast Guard climbs into a suburban and makes the trip to Winona to arrest the man with the boat. What he's doing is illegal, he's told. You try to help folks out, and all you get is a kick in the ass. The grocery is gone. The brewery is gone. Gone the house where my father was born. Gone the warehouse where we hung deer in November. Gone the shop with its cigar boxes full of bolts, hinges, flanges, copper wire, ball bearings, or anything someone might have saved for projects yet to be imagined. The cellar where the wash tubs bubbled to keep the bait fish alive, one full of bullheads, one of minnows, where geraniums overwintered, where the dug bulbs of tulips were gnawed by muskrats during floods, that has been filled and paved. A gas pump stands where the glider rocked, a lit sign where the bridal wreath once cast its white profusion to the sun. The sheep are gone from Grandma Haney's pasture. The last badger was shot from Wiggy Stuber's field. There's no money in milk anymore, and you marry your herd anyhow, and who wants to be that bound to anything that won't love you back? The golden plump plant expands in Arcadia, and the owners go to Mexico to recruit. 
You know the workers by the angry rash from fingertip to shoulder, inflamed by chicken water seeping inside their arm-length plastic gloves. The bluffs are covered in cedars since no one grazes anything there anymore. Who will remember the lodge hall and the good times had there? Who will remember the handshake for the Rebecca's? No one visited the museum, so the society put it up for sale. A millionaire hangs cottages from the bluffs, rents them to businessmen who drive here from Chicago or Milwaukee to hunt the deer that breed and fatten at the edges of fallow fields. The heads are left with the taxidermist, the meat dropped off at the church. Old houses go vacant, new ones get built, ugly, vaulted ceilings, windows the full two stories of their angular fronts that jut like glass barge prows from the bluffs. Hilbert is dead, Mutz is dead, Chester has turned to crumbs in his grave. No one remembers when Babe Schwark died and Booty Schmidt is up to the home for good. Piggy is long gone, home, his headstone says. The inveterate drinkers warm bar stools at the Golden Frog and only those from away have anything to do with the monarch. Mother's sweater sat unsold in the gift shop until Papa reclaimed it in a huff. The property dispute over the mule pasture fence has finally run its course. No one wins, though the surveyor got struck by lightning and is dead. The old steamboat dry docked in Winona got hauled to the landfill, and someone trained lights on the outcropping of Sugarloaf Bluff to form, at night, the jagged outline of a cross. There are those who claim the DNR has let loose breeding pairs of mountain lions in the bluffs around Wamandy. The warden says that's nonsense, but why would anyone believe him? Someone burned down the Chicken Valley Strip Club where the girl who won the state cross-country meet ended up pole dancing, and where her driver's ed teacher and basketball coach went to watch her on Friday nights. The road dogs host a car shoot to raise money for a cancerous friend. Put a car in neutral, roll it down a hill, and for ten bucks you get to shoot the car as many times as you can. Helps if you're drunk. A well-meaning ornithologist opened a raptor center as a local attraction. Populated it with the dumb and clumsy, unlucky birds electrocuted by power lines, shot by moral derelicts with crossbows, the poisoned, those whose taste for roadkill tangled them with a car. The eagles hop awkwardly around their pens, glare through the wire, their talons like pruning shears gripping the perches of what will be their last home. I'm the end of a genetic line. A family dies with me. This is hardly a tragedy. We are not an impressive group in intellect or physical form. With weak hearts, myopic, we paddle lazily down the human genome, pausing to root briefly here on the riverbank in the shade of these limestone bluffs. In an early photograph I have, part of the town goes up in flames, a premonition from the 1880s. A group of women, corseted, skirts infested with lace, watch from behind a buckboard as ash flings itself into the sky. To the right, the blur of a girl rushes away like a ghost. No face, hardly a form, just a hat and a dress and the news of a fire, though no one is alive who knows her name. And I'll end with that. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm trading places now you don't, you don't with Mary. Okay. Mark, Mark, thank you. Oh, that was so great. I just love listening to the sounds that unroll as you read these poems and all of those incredible place names. He's Mary. from the Driftless region. But when he read that, you didn't say I'm from there. Oh. But you are. I am. Yeah, I I'm know, because I've seen photographs of the cliffs. That's right. Oh, I love that. Mary, I'm going to introduce you. Are you ready? Uh, yeah. Okay. Mary Rufel is a poet, a writer, an essayist, and a visual artist, and the author of over a dozen books of poems, essays, and short fiction, including Dunce 2019, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the 2020 Pulitzer Prize. 
Mary is also the author of the fantastic essay collection, Madness, Rack, and Honey, and the work of fiction, the most of it, which I found, Mary, and one thing that is really amazing about this book, and my students, if you are there and still listening, you read these pieces, and sometimes you don't know if you're reading fiction or nonfiction or poetry, and after a while, questions of genre just kind of go out the window, and I, I kind of love that about this book. And then, of course, A Little White Shadow from 2006, a book of erasures that has become very famous. A full-color facsimile of Mary's erasure, An Incarnation of the Now, was published in a limited edition by C. Double Press. Mary is a graduate of Bennington College, where she studied literature, and is a resident of Bennington, Vermont, is a recipient of numerous honors, including an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and a Whiting Award, and Mary is currently the Vermont State Poet Laureate, and is teaching at Bennington College this semester. Please welcome Mary Rufel. Thank you, Dana. Abacus. I buried the questions. I lowered the questions with my hands. I said to the questions, you are bird lime. You are stone gone mad black. The pause in my monologue, little lawless grotesques. You are slow eyed and wear slippers, skedaddle to the earth's molten core. Then thinking, I put the sign for questions over the questions, lest God mistake them for answers. Then I counted the questions, then recorded the number for fear you should not be able to count. Tea ceremony. At my father's funeral, it took seven minutes for four white gloved hands to fold the flag into a three cornered tea bag. The way they whisked each seam emptied my mind. One of the gloves, a tea stained where the thumb meets the palm. Then the stained one knelt and handed me the flag and I bowed down to smell the scentless stars. Diary circa 1900. The sun shines and the wind blows. Swept and dusted, the usual. Went to the bay, had a mosquito parade, a fine supper of bass and peas. Rode to the island for berries, but there weren't any. Had a pain in the attic, took powder. Chased a bat in full undress, or it did me. Managed to get up without mother's call. The old lady was quite civil, finished faggoting her yoke, held someone's kitten, ate peanuts. Mildred and Fred treated us to bananas, ate them in the cemetery, saw all that was going on. I'm just flipping through old books here, trying to... The brooch. After Keats's death, Severin wanted to have made a gold brooch in the shape of a lyre with strands of John's hair for the strings. In Oceana, this doesn't amount to a thing. The Hawaiian king stood resplendent in his cape of feathers. 90,000 birds were captured and killed for their orange and yellow wings. It took a century to complete, a century for a man to become a bird. Keats took a few minutes one afternoon while writing a letter. Still, there is no pin. In all of Rome, Severin could not find a goldsmith who could crimp the hair strings in.
the cart. The empty grocery cart is beginning to roll across the empty parking lot. It's beginning to act like Marlon Brando might if no one were watching. It's a joyous sight, but it might not end all that happily, the way someone light in the head does something charming and winds up dead. My thoughts are so heavy, you couldn't lift the beer. They are so light and stray so far, someone in a uniform wants to bring them in. The world might be in agony, but I don't think so. Somewhere, a woman is swathed in black veils and smiling, too. It might be the eve of her baptism, the day after her son hit a pole. How can she signal her acceptance of life? What if a hummingbird enters her mouth? I hate the thought, whizzing by in red clothes. Yet I admire its gloves. Hands are unbearably beautiful. They hold on to things. They let things go. Perpetually attempting to soar. A boy from Brooklyn used to cruise on summer nights. As soon as he'd hit 60, he'd hold his hand out the window, cupping it around the wind. He'd been assured this is exactly how a woman's breast feels like, feels when you put your hand around it and apply a little pressure. Now he knew, and he loved it. Night after night, again and again, until the weather grew cold and he had to roll the window up. For many years afterwards, he was perpetually attempting to soar. One winter's night, holding his wife's breast in his hand, he closed his hand, eyes and wanted to weep. He loved her, but it was the wind he imagined now. As he grew older, he loved the word etc. and refused to abbreviate it. He loved sweet white butter. He often pretended to be playing the organ. On one of his last mornings, he noticed the shape of his face molded in the pillow. He shook it out, but the next morning, it reappeared. White Peaches. Um, this poem was set to music by a rock band in Brooklyn some years ago. I discovered by accident and, and confronted them with the fact and they profusely apologized for not letting me know and promised me to send me their next CD. I, that's the last I've ever heard of them. <laughs> White Peaches. Someday I'll be dead in no need of a smoke, cash, bread, completely indifferent to poetry. Why not nag now, push the little eye around while I can, backed up by the whole language, peeled in one strip, a dazzling case of deft motion. Because there are days the scent of white peaches reaches me in bursts, and I lie down, alive, completely indifferent to poetry. <laughs> Glory. The autumn aster, those lavender ones, and the dark blooming sedum are beginning to bloom in the rainy earth with the remote intensity of a dream. These things take over. I am a glorifier, not very high up on the vocational chart, and I glorify everything I see, everything I can think of. I want ordinary men and women brushing their teeth to feel the ocean in their mouth. I am going to glorify the sink with toothpaste spat in it. I am going to say it's a stretch of beach where the foam rolls back and leaves little shells. Ordinary people with fear of word worldly things, illness, pain, accident, poverty, of dark, of being alone, of misfortune. The fears of everyday life, people who quietly and secretly bear their dread, who do not speak freely of it to others. 
People who have difficulty separating themselves from the world around them, like a spider hanging off the spike of a spider mum in an inland autumn, away from the sea, away from that most unfortunate nation where people are dying of meat and drink. I want to glorify the even tinier spiders in the belly of the spider and in the closed knot of the mum's corolla, so this is likely to go on into winter. Didn't I say we were speaking of autumn with the remote intensity of a dream? The deckle edge of a cloud, blood seeping through a bandage, three bleached beech leaves hanging on a twig, a pair of ruined mushrooms, the incumbent snow, the very air, the imported light, all autumn struggling to be gay as people do in the midst of their woe. I met a psychic who told me my position in the universe but could not find the candy she hid from her grandkids. The ordinary fear of losing one's mind. You rinse the sink, walk out into the October sunshine and look for it by beginning to think. That's when I saw the autumn aster, the sedum blooming in a purple field. The psychic said, I must see the word glory emblazoned on my chest. Secretly, I was hoping for a better word. I would have chosen for myself an ordinary one, like paw, something that would have no meaning in the astral realm. One doesn't want to glorify everything. One, What might I actually say when confronted with the view from K2? I'm not sure I would say anything. What's your opinion? You're a man with a corona in your mouth, a woman with a cotton ball in her purse. What's your conception of the world? Wow, I'm reading these really old poems, and it's fun because when I read them, I go, I would write that very differently today. That needs a lot of cuts, um, a lot of editing. That's fun. All right, I'm going to read a poem by Mark Wonderlich from his new book, God of Nothingness. I love this poem. However, it has a line of German in it. And even though he told me how to properly pronounce it, I have forgotten. So I am going to butcher the German line, just so you know. Proposition by Mark Wunderlich. That the smell of cows drifting in the open window is, indeed, that of a living beast. That I, too, am a living beast that the body I possess is inhabited only by me, that my body is neither at rest nor occupied by dramatic motion, that I am, by my best account, fully alive, that the room in which I am seated is in Germany in a town called Vorpswede, that a poet I admire once lived here too, though he is long since dead. Rilke wrote, that I gently wipe away the look of suffered injustice sometimes hinders the pure motion of spirits a little. That there are such things as spirits. That we were born suffering, but that we are not meant to suffer. That the wind blows and the birches outside my window sing a little. And that cooing and chucking of the dove I hear is also a kind of song. That the difference between the living and the dead is mostly one of conjugation. Er starb, er ist gestorben, ein gestorbenes Mensch. That what we make when we speak is a kind of music, but disjointed. And that music seeks a unity that our speech does not possess. Once I felt as though I was dead, but now the reason for that feeling baffles me. I marvel at what it is to feel the sun on my skin. Burnished is the word that comes into my head. Burnished by the sun as if my torso was a copper shield that my torso is a kind of shield protecting the inside from the outside. Though we all know we are penetrable in many ways. That's an astonishing poem. Anyway, 
Um, moving through some other old books here. Um, keeping an eye on the clock. The meal that was always there. It was a dangerous day. The earth was shining and the sun drank its joy. The little goat was chomping columbine. All the babies smelled the sweet milk. The old folks sold their recipes. All the women followed them. The men ate, pulled off their boots and wiggled their toes. The trout responded to the water and the hermit found his her herbs nearby. The radiance of circles had never been wider, more one inside of the other. Who began to feed the goat the pages of a book? Who began to feed the goat the tragedies of Shakespeare? What would we do without them? The refrigerator. There is the sound of the refrigerator being on. There is the sound of God beating inside my heart which is a strange sound since he does not exist. There is the sound of a stone sent years ago, which was never answered. There is the sound of handwriting on a human forehead. There is the sound of 43 ducks flying through glass. There is the sound of a feather duster. There is the sound of dust heard over the telephone. There is the sound of a piano with a faint heart coming from below a hell where people are happy. There is the sound of someone standing on the grave of someone they do not know and do not care about. There is the sound the same person makes standing on their own grave. I love the sound of the iron on the ironing board turning on and off, waiting for someone to come. There is the sound of an electrical bill. There is the sound of a book lying closed, which is the sound of the storm painter in his dungeon. There is the sound of someone saying your name, which, if they did not have to, they would not want to. There is the sound of peaceful breathing in a far cranny, where mouths all over the body break into smiles. There is the sound of a razor traveling with a hair. There is the profound sound of plates being stacked. Or is it the sound of dinkiness I hear? There is the sound of the refrigerator being off. There is the sound of everyone thinking the same thing at the same time, and the sound of one leafing through a magazine, looking for a lifestyle. There is the sound of a cat on a hot tin roof, which is the imaginary sound of silk. The two greatest Egyptian gods made love in the womb. They were twins, so the sound of their birth was the sound of a pregnant baby. And this baby gave birth in turn, which is time, to the sound of the world in which you live. Um, Lillian. This is a poem about a um, great, great, great problem I have. How you can remember, not only in a single day, hour, but in a day, all the artists you love, there's not room in your mind for them. So a few come in and the rest go out and you can't hold all the art you love. You can never hold it all at once. This frustrates me. It's called Lillian after Lillian Gish. Jesus was in way over his head. That's why he wore a halo. That's why he made her a star, though no one could have played a better he than she. In way down east, broken blossoms, orphans of the storm, and hearts of the world. But the trouble with the spirit of art is, if I think of Lillian, I forget Brock reformed, destroyed, resuscitated. And I forget Lee Ho, who rode a donkey, stuffing his knapsack with scraps of writing to shuffle later into discontinuous poems. And I forget Morandi, who lived in his mother's apartment and painted bottles far into the night. When I look into Lillian's eyes, I forget everything else. 
which is what love is. So Jesus forgot the few nails in his wrists and Brock was able to paint him that way as a woman holding a mandolin and Morandi threw what looks like a stone into one of his bottles, thus painting the secret of life exposed. Errand. To find things out, that is the great adventure. To find out the writing on the birthday cake was toothpaste. To find out musical chairs was for real. Find out Lord made the world, then threw the leftover rocks in a pile and left. Nettles growing nearby spliced themselves into days. Find it out. Checklist griff, bitter love, modern hell, bloody tears. Beneath an ordinary glance dwells an explosive. Go to market. Find all this out. Find everything out. Even if your last day is incomplete, even if something up there thinks you are Mars upon, keep finding out. For the stork who dropped us off in the wilderness returns, but with a bigger maw this time so he can accommodate us and all that we have found out, even if the terriblest part is so condensed, we bear a resemblance to the night sky. Um, winding down here. Just, I'll close with uh, two poems here. Um, if, I guess it's a kind of homage to, you know, Rudyard Kipling has a famous, you probably don't read Rudyard Kipling. I do, but if. If you were going to the island, to the lighthouse, to the harbor light, to the Arctic by canoe, to the birdhouse, or to the opera. If you are going to the Finland station, or the Hartford Convention, to Bedlam and part way back, or to Brooklyn to begin again, to bear any burden, to be of use, to do no harm to the happy, to dwell in peace, to hear a nightingale, or perchance to the Sargasso Sea, to hunt in the morning, to know a woman, to kill a mockingbird, to the scaffold, or wish to be in England, to be or not to be, to the precipice, to heaven on horseback, or to the ends of the earth. Turn on the dark light of the soul with a vault of lunar courage. Remember that. That was a fun poem to write and very easy. I just had a stack of old library cards, and uh, those are all the titles of the books that began with the word... Um, going to or something or if or no going going to going you know going to I'll close with this it's called breath village it's newer around 460 BC people began to talk to one another all over the world different little spots lit up with conversation now we are one blazing ball of light hurtling through space, trying to talk to another planet. The origins of silence are much less clear, though most believe it began with little A who lived on an island and listened to seashells instead of his mother. So if you are listening now, you have a choice. Thanks, thank you. Uh, thank you, esteemed invisible ones. <laughs> Yay! I'm so happy. This was so great. Uh, invisible ones, we now have time for Q&A. If you have any questions for Mark and Mary, and while I'm letting you decide if you have a question for Mark and Mary, if you are one of my students, please say hello in the chat. So I know you are here and I'm going to begin with a question, which is, you know, listening. I mean, I know your work and I, uh, the work of both of you. And but listening tonight, I was so struck by just how invested you are in the 
in the minutia of the ordinary. And I'm so curious if that was something that you remember happening as children. Were there, you know, what things, do you have a vivid memory of a thing calling your attention or a collection of things calling your attention? Um, Mark, maybe you could answer first and then Mary. I'm very curious about this. Um, sure. I, I, um, I, I think I was certainly very interested in things and, um, but I had a, a sort of extraordinary experience in, in my childhood in that my grandfather, uh, my, my grandparents who lived in town, we lived out on a farm, but they lived in town and they had a warehouse in back of their property. And it used to be a big tobacco warehouse because in this part of Wisconsin, they grow tobacco. Um, and the family had owned a, a cigar factory at one point. Um, but the other thing, since the 1850s or so, when my family moved there, they filled this warehouse full of stuff, which was there stayed there for for decades. And when we finally sold that property after my grandparents' death, we started cleaning out this warehouse, which had things like a whole sleigh, like a, a horse-drawn sleigh, which had been hoisted way up into the rafters that we didn't really even know was there, which was lowered down, like this thing from another century that kind of came down. There were cigar boxes full of things in them. Um, there were kind of extraordinary tools. There were all of these sorts of objects that really connected the present with the past in extraordinary ways. I remember thinking a lot about that and, and just thinking about all this stuff, which, you know, had to be kind of got rid of and redistributed. So I don't know, that's just a memory, I think. I don't know if that answers your question, Dana, but I'm very curious to hear what Mary has to say about things. Um. I don't know or remember, but I, I can make up a pretty good answer, I think. I, you know, when you're a kid and the, and the big things around you are too difficult or painful to deal with, you can't process them with a child brain. You retreat into tiny things that you can control. And so you retreat into small things and you play with 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 you know with buttons and um because it's something you can you can control the small when you can't control the big i mean that that is whatever but mark and i are very much interested in do you know that i have had a conversation with mark about victorian hair receivers oh, yes. and we yeah, both yeah. get very excited yeah, 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 yeah. okay now yeah. what is a victorian hair receiver in the evening when a, um, a woman in Victorian England would um, brush her long, beautiful hair, su such as yours, some of the hair would come out in the brush and you take all the hair from the brush and you put it into a porcelain, special porcelain bowl with a small hole and with a lid and a small hole. It's called a hair receiver and you collect your own hair. Now, you collect your own hair <laughs> in order to make hair, hair pieces. Um, so it was called a hair, well, you, you know, like the Gibson girls, so who, when they would have yeah. that up, you know, it sort of rolled up that kind of sausage roll of hair <laughs> around there. Yeah. And the, the way you achieved that was to make what was called a hair rat with two T's, R-A-T-T. -T. So you would have a hair net and you would stuff it with your own hair and then you would put that around and lift oh. your you know, comb and pin mm -hmm. your hair up into this. And of course, then the hair piece was your hair. It was the same color and same consistency. So mm -hmm. it became invisible. But those giant, you know, hairdos. But if 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 you happen to be deceased, they could use your hair to make the, the jewelry out of your hair. You know, jewelry was made. But Mark, you have to tell them what you do with your hair that in your hair receiver because it is so beautiful <laughs> well i have a hair receiver at mary's urging i got i found a hair receiver mm -hmm. and um i put all of my hair out in the rose bushes for uh the house wrens to make use in their nests and then i look for the nests occasionally they blow mm -hmm. out of places and then i find them lined with my hair it's mm -hmm. a kind of and thing that, i like to do so wonderful 
Oh my God, I love that so much. You know, one time I was standing in front of a store window in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It, the store was called Serendipity. And I felt this weird, like very soft movement right here. And I was like, what is that? And I put my hand up and it was a bird yeah. who was plucking one of my hairs out for a nest. Mm -hmm. It was like totally amazing. I can't believe you have a hair receiver, Mark. Let me tell you, I have contributions <laughs> <laughs> because I shed. All right. So we have some questions. Uh, first, we have a question from Travis Smith. And Travis is asking, was there a writer who you felt was a particularly good companion in the deeper depths of the pandemic, Mary, or one who living through 2020 changed your experience of? There's no writer that was any more special to me during the pandemic than any other time in my life. I'd have to say that. I mean, no one comes to mind. Yeah. I like, I buried myself, but I, but I, I could have, I could say this about any winter, any year, you know, um, Issa, yeah, Issa, uh, Japanese uh, haiku master, Issa, because uh, one of his haikus uh, goes like something along the lines of, uh, uh, took a nap, no one punished me. Yeah, yeah, napped half the day, no one punished me. That napped half the day that you got it napped half the day no one punished me it's a it's always a delight i love haiku um as, well i mean passion and My well passion. it's just like an instant of time right and it's just like yeah yeah mark how about you was there anybody during the pandemic that where you thought i'm especially <laughs> this is especially working with me through this moment i um I, I would, I guess I would kind of concur with, with Mary about that, but I will say what I did read during the pandemic, I read, um, I went back to Thomas Mann and I read The Magic Mountain, mm -hmm. which I had read years and years ago in German. And I didn't, at that time, I think when I was in college and I read it, I didn't understand that he was funny. And now, <laughs> then I it turns out it's the point <laughs> that it's actually, you know, that he's hilarious. <laughs> and Budden Brooks, his first novel is, is so deeply funny. It is a, it is a book. I mean, it's about the decline of a family. And so it's in that way you're watching this is kind of, not, not such a tragedy unfold, really just kind of time mm -hmm. unfold. And, and, and that was quite something. And I also um, read um, Dr. Faustus and that's another really, really funny and strange book. And he gets very deep into musicology and writing about, you know, Schoenberg essentially is who he's kind of thinking about, but it's, it's, they're extraordinarily funny funny, funny books. And I guess I just felt transported by them to these worlds. And I just always think, you know, it, it became my, my, uh, my boyfriend also read um, uh, uh, the magic mountain the same time we did. And so we kept, when we'd see groups of people who were misbehaving, we'd say, it's the bad Russian table, I which read, there was remember the good Russian table and the bad I Russian read, table. I <laughs> read the magic mountain in my twenties. I have no memory of it being funny at all. <laughs> yes. You know, I would never right. guess, but I can imagine now. Yeah. I think in my twenties, yeah. I didn't, I did, I really didn't understand that it was mm. funny. Well, I just, I was blown out by things like how Hans Castorp is running around with a locket that has an X-ray of the Countess's <laughs> tubercular lungs. You know, <laughs> like oh, as wow. his romantic object or like there's a whole chapter where all he does is describe the inside of her body you know not like her not like like the outer sensuous side but like the blood vessels and the, you know i mean i just i just couldn't believe this it is weird it's a weird book it's an interesting book to read during a pandemic mark because they're all trapped on that in that sanatorium with tuberculosis right yeah. they're having yeah. their own little pandemic they're trapped there on the mountainside, you know, where they're, um, 
receiving terrible treatment. You know, I mean, they're just yeah. like, they eat a lot of cream. That's what I remember. They're, they're walking in the meadows and they're e eating <laughs> they're stuffing themselves. And it's oh just, my God. there's sort of nothing to be done but the mountain <laughs> air, and, you know, and frequent x rays. And, yeah. um, and it's all about the kind of intrigues of this little sequestered society up there on the mountainside. And, and it's, it's just, it, you know, and it goes on and on. It, that's the other thing. It's it really does just go on, um, and yeah, yeah. I love. I, I just loved it. I was transported, yeah. and which is what I wanted to be. As a young person, I hated reading it and ended up loving it. Um, and I so I recommend you all read Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain and just be a gog. Um, <laughs> A question from Sarah Darnell. How do you create such interesting slant rhymes? Do you have a thesaurus or just enter your internal vocabulary and ponder what words have a particular sonic quality to them? Is pondering involved? And this is for, this is for both of you. Rhyming is kind of the most, it's the most intoxicating kind of magical illogical force in poetry that propels, can learn to propel you through the poem. I think in recent years, I've started rhyming a whole lot. And I just, once I start doing it, it's all I want to do. It's like you're connecting with something. It's, you're not thinking, you're just, the, the words are just kind of pulling you forward. And, and so I find myself often rhyming in, in, in the middle of lines where I just want that, that sound to kind of keep happening. <laughs> Once it starts happening, I, it's like all I want to take place. I just want that magic to happen. And then I'll step out of the way. I get to get out of the way and the poem just begins yeah. to begins to fly. So it just happens. You don't use a thesaurus or, or anything like that at all. Just, flows through it's totally associative it's totally the the associative irrational mind liking sound yeah how about you mary um i don't own a thesaurus and i don't think i could possibly ponder it because i don't know what a slant rhyme is <laughs> i love it <laughs> i've heard the term and i pretend that i know what it is <laughs> and all i see is something I yeah. see a slash. That's like, right. Mm, okay, mm. so here, here's like the best, one of the best examples of slant rhymes, and I'm not going to get it totally right. And it's from the end of Proof Rock when he says, um, I have seen the mermaids on the beach singing something each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. Beach and each, that rhymes. That's an exact rhyme. And then me is a slant rhyme. So with, what's up? With what? It's a slant rhyme with each and beach. So you get the E sign, you get the each, and me, each, but you me. don't get the CH sound. So that's the slant. Oh, the reason I like it is because in that, in that moment in Proof Rock, Proof Rock is like those mermaids are on the beach. They're singing each to each, but they won't sing to me. So like he can't make the exact rhyme. It's only uh, going to go okay. slant, you know? Anyway, I love you, Mary. I love that you confess that. I think that's the most beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, but does rhyming just flow through you? It's just something that just happens. I love it. I mean, yeah. I, I love it. It's just, yeah. It's. Did you ever have anybody tell you to stop doing it? Like in school or anything like that? Because the modernists were very much like, no, 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 no. Good. No. Nobody right. cared enough. <laughs> right. Nobody cared enough. <laughs> no one, no one like cared enough. <laughs> okay, this question is from Molly. I don't know if I'm going to say your name, your last name, quite right, Molly. Molly Ebel. Um, they say to be a good writer, you need to be a good reader. What is your ratio between reading time and writing time? I read more than I write. Me too. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I I kind of make really in the last couple of years, I make a point where I'm reading at least an hour a day. Like I like to start the day doing that. And I'm trying to, you know, actually. And I also, I will confess, I listen to 
often listen to long things on uh, audiobooks. I love audiobooks. I listen to when yeah. I'm walking or when I like I'm doing mm -hmm. housework. I listen to nonfiction that way, things that are sort of information based. Sometimes I'll just listen to those. So I kind of count that too. Um, but yeah, definitely read much more than I write. Yeah. Um, my reading has fallen apart. <laughs> oh, I'm just mostly reading manuscripts in process by students, yeah. and friends and contests. And I think the bulk of my reading life is work that hasn't even seen the light of day, you know, from a publishing standpoint, but I'm looking forward to reading more uh, once the school year is over. Um, Joseph Clark um, is asking, despite the quarantine keeping us indoors during the first year of the pandemic, did you find yourself more or less busy with your work? I'm assuming with your creative work. I hope that's what Joseph means. I don't really remember, but I would assume more. I mean, I, I loved every minute of it. I wish we were still in lockdown. <laughs> But, you know, I, I mean to I mean I it's also important to acknowledge the extent of the suffering and death and and I want to acknowledge that but I I loved it was just wonderful to you know not be able to leave the house except to get food and, and to have that be okay like to be to have, yeah, that, to have that be okay yeah. okay I liked it a lot you know, I did too in that first month. Um, I, I, I did too. Um, then I didn't. <laughs> Mark, how about you? I, I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And I did things that I never expected to do, like teaching a whole class on Rilke through the mail. Yeah. And yeah. that was me writing these, you know, essays about, about oh, him. Oh, those letters are so beautiful. That's right. You were you were a recipient, a recipient, yeah. and I I didn't expect that I would be doing that. And and I, you know, like like Mary, I have to say, when it happened, when it you know we sort of became sequestered, I thought, oh, I've been preparing my whole life for this. Mm. It's like I've got a house full of books. I, you know, I'm like lucky that I live in the country. I like my own cooking. <laughs> I mean, all, all of the, all of those those sort of things. It was there was a way in which that happened, and I also would say I realized just how completely fortunate I was by those you know made fortunate by those circumstances, and didn't wasn't forced to go out wasn't wasn't someone who had to you know be endangered for my job, and you know it was it became possible to do that, yeah. and in that way it was it was. Um, you know, there was that terrible sense of that we didn't know where this was going and how long it would last and how would it get worse. Um, but there was also kind of like Mary, a sort of relief at at this imposed kind of solitude that that certainly, you know, felt um, it had certain possibilities to it as well. Yeah. Well, Slowing down wasn't a bad thing, you know, coming to a full stop had its issues, but now we're in the brave new world. So I am, there's two last questions and then we'll probably wrap it up. The first one is informational. Travis Smith is wondering, what is the recommended translation for the Magic Mountain? And Mark, you you are our German speaker. So, you know, who did you read? Um, <laughs> gosh, I wish I could tell you, although I will tell you that, that I, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. It's, it's, a uh, I, there's two, um, two people translated it and it was, um, I'm going to have to look it up and maybe, uh, uh, see if I can add it to the chat on YouTube or something. I'll put it in as a comment, but I can tell you that Susan Barnofsky is currently doing a new translation of the magic mountain. And I am so excited yeah, about she's that. She's so wonderful. Yeah. And that'll be, um, that'll be a terrific one. Um, Do you know, is she done or is she in the middle of it? She's in the middle. I mean, it's enormous. It's going to take, she did post a, um, 
a, uh, a April Fool's joke saying that she had finished ahead of time. And of course, <laughs> because, you know, and all apparently the only people who understood she was joking were her translator friends who were like, there's no chance. She could really. So anyway, but I'm looking forward to that very much. Yeah. Okay. And our last question is for Mary from Anthony Hamilton, Sebastian DiCarlo. I recently read My Private Property after having loved your lineated poetry for many years. How does your experience writing prose poems, short form prose, differ from writing the other poems, if at all? Well, I hear them very differently in my mind. The rhythms are very different. And um, I don't know how to say this because I don't want to whatever you think they are is fine with me. You know, I don't, but I don't think they're poems. To me, those books are prose. Mm. Um, poems, poems are lineated and prose has a right flush margin. So I call them prose pieces. And in that book, they're prose pieces. And then there's an essay. My, the, my, the title piece is so clearly an essay. So there's essays and then there's, prose pieces and then I guess the, the color pieces are prose poems so it's, all I know is I hear I hear I hear them differently I don't hear them lineated I hear them as running to a right margin and Running's then you hear you hear other poems as <laughs> um, as lineated with with almost a more incantatory delivery and a yes yes yeah. i it is it is in my ear that i hear them different differently yeah it, I, it, I do too when i when i, I work on verse and prose just, i just hear it different mm -hmm. it's so it's auditory and when a piece starts do you have a sense pretty soon whether it's going to be prose or verse oh i know before i write the first word i hear it and I hear it, and then I know before I write what it's going. To. I've never started a poem and turned it into prose, mm. or or vice versa. I think it happened once. I think it happened once where I started something and said this is wrong. But most most of the time, I know before I begin. Mm. Yeah, right. Mark, do you ever write prose poems? Oh yeah, yeah, I do. After. I mean, have you done it recently? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. In fact, um, I have a whole new project where I'm writing short prose pieces and it's called my 19th century childhood. Ooh. Oh, this, oh I think I can just tell that this that. is great. <laughs> yes, on, on yes, okay, so this is another manuscript in process I would like to read to continue my my, you know, the way I read things. <laughs> so um Everybody, Invisible Ones, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you so, so much, Mary Rufel and Mark Wonderlich for being with us at St. Louis Poetry Center. If you live in St. Louis or, or are in driving distance, I really encourage you to see Mary's exhibition. It's called Mary Rufel Erasures. It is at the High Low Literary Arts Cafe um, in the city. It closes on April 19th. It's just really great. Um, this has been so wonderful to live with both of you for the last number of weeks. Um, and I, I can't wait to, maybe I can come to Vermont and see you or both of you can come here. And um, I'm just very happy to see your faces. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, D Dana. And thank you, Aaron, behind yeah. the scenes for all your hard work. Thanks, everybody. St. Louis. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Tina. Yeah.